Hey, it's Kay. And this is Skittles, dance instructor. You keep saying things like, down with the bourgeoisie, eat the rich, sodomize the landowners, impel all people who have more than 25 real in their pocket, literally murder all human beings regardless of their political beliefs. That kind of stuff. Disco Elysium is a game deeply concerned with history. The rich and fascinating history of its own world, of Revachol, but also our history. In the real world, Disco Elysium reflects our world back at us with often very few embellishments. In literary criticism, there is something called mimesis, a Greek word coined by Plato which means imitation. When a text is engaging in imitation, it is attempting to, well, imitate reality, to depict something real by creating a direct representation of that thing. Think of a realist painting, like this one, as opposed to a more abstract painting, like this one. Revachol isn't real per se. There's no archipelago of islands full of vaguely French people in places with names like Jamrock and Martinez that happen to be the site of a major weak link in the chain of the global economy. This world is fictional, yes, but you've been here before, haven't you? to a place where children are doomed from the start because of the bitter poverty they grew up in. A place where workers are at odds with their bosses, and the more they recognize the reality of that conflict, the more violent the methods of their bosses become. A world living in the shadow of failed revolutions, of sincere attempts to make a better world that were met with unimaginable violence. This place isn't alien to us. Often, when fiction wants to tackle real-world political issues, they'll work it into their universe in such a way that it requires a bit of intentional reading to suss out what they're trying to say. Something like X-Men using mutants to tell stories about racism and later homophobia. Or Final Fantasy VII using bona fide magic and meteors and angels to talk about the environmental destruction of our industry and the ways the systems built around around that industry can restrict our ability to see the bigger picture. Look, it ain't subtle, but it's an allegory. Disco Elysium explores many of the same ideas that a genre like cyberpunk does, but without speculating on what the future might look like. Instead, it concerns itself with our present. When we go into Kuno's home and find his father in an unconscious drunken stupor, this is not a bunch of sim addicts in Shadowrun, this could be one of our fathers, right now. When an extremely unwell woman gets a hold of your gun because there is no infrastructure to help people struggling like she is, this is not some malfunctioning android being hunted by future cops. This could be you or me, or someone we care about, right now. The cold confidence of power in Joyce the Wild Pines rep is not some hyperbolized super corpo buying and selling people on the future dark web. This is your manager, your boss, the people who own us right now. So the world of Disco Elysium is mimetic. It reflects our world back at us, but there's one big difference that stands out. Everyone in this world seems to have an unusual frankness about their socioeconomic position in it. There's a reason for that. Every major political actor in this game has a distinctly Marxist perspective. Even Joyce, the face of soulless, unfiltered capitalism, dubbed an ultra-liberal in the game's world, couldn't be more upfront with the fact that, yes, she is the bourgeoisie. I am a bourgeois woman, and this is my long, incredibly lightweight, interminably bourgeois boat. There's no obfuscation, no bullshitting about how Wild Pines is one big happy family and there's totally no conflict between the workers and the owners. Joyce is fully aware of the economic reality she exists in. She just thinks it's a good thing. Or at least she enjoys being on top in this historical moment. 
And this brings us back to history. Marxism is not just a philosophy or an approach to economics, it is also a framework for understanding history. According to Marx, the material conditions of a society and the productive forces and class conflicts therein are what drive history forward, as opposed to any great men and their great ideas. Keep that idea in mind. This is, in its simplest terms, historical materialism. Martinez is a place desperately struggling to reckon with its own history. With the revolution that was brutally snuffed out by a liberal democratic coalition that now seems to control almost everything. Martinez has been trapped in a sort of stasis ever since the new world that was trying to be born was denied. Old men still obsessing over old battles and the loss of a woman they both loved literally sit all day bickering in a crater created by the artillery that bombarded the revolutionaries 50 years prior. Look, it ain't subtle, but it's an allegory. You play alcoholic fuck-up cop Harry Dubois, who mirrors the same conflict Martinez is struggling with in his personal life. He was left by the woman he loved and tried to drink himself into such an oblivion that he could forget her. Forget the pain that the past was causing him. So much of modern politics seems to fulfill that same function. To justify why attempts at moving past the current capitalist system were wrong, whether morally or logically, history has to be rewritten and selectively erased. We see this reflected in Martinez in The Fascists, turning to bizarre race science and petty nationalism to answer the question, hey, why does everything here suck so much? Likewise, other people put their trust in the coalition to take away that lingering doubt, that feeling like something's wrong. They've brought order, haven't they? Or maybe you put your trust in the union. After all, revolution is a hard and bloody thing. Perhaps if we just win ourselves a slightly larger piece of the pie, it'll all be... well, we'll be able to live with it. When it comes to depicting different political ideologies, Disco Elysium stands apart from games like The Outer Worlds, which feel the need to always try to carve out some kind of middle ground, even if it's a middle ground between a factory town that treats workers like slaves and denies them life-saving medicine, and the people who would prefer not to do that. Disco Elysium doesn't bullshit you about its political position. It doesn't pretend to be neutral while implicitly favoring the status quo. It depicts fascists as ignorant, violent assholes with absurd and incoherent views. If you adopt fascist ideas as Harry, you'll actually hurt yourself whenever you espouse them. Specifically, you'll hurt your morale health bar, which is tied to your volition skill. Volition is part of the psyche skill category, which basically includes anything you'd consider emotional intelligence. The way health works in this game means that when you take damage to one of your two health bars, the corresponding stat is actually lowered until you heal. So you literally diminish your emotional intelligence by espousing fascist beliefs. Likewise, ideologically driven capitalists, ultra-liberals like Joyce, are depicted as cynical technocratic monsters. While moralists, liberal adherents of the dominant ideology, are basically blind to their own ideology, seeing themselves as an absence of ideology. This might sound familiar. Moralists don't really have beliefs. Sometimes they stumble on one, like on a child's toy left on the carpet. The toy must be put away immediately, and the child reprimanded. Centrism is a change. Not even incremental change. It is control over yourself and the world. Exercise it. Look up at the sky, at the dark shapes of the coalition airships hanging there. Ask yourself, is there something sinister in moralism? And then answer, no. God is in his heaven. Everything is normal on earth. Holy shit. Your trusty partner, Kim, and I want to make it clear here that Kim is a wonderful and reliable friend who has never done anything wrong, considers himself apolitical. He tells you that he's only concerned with facts. Concerned with what 
is. Of course, what goes unstated is that he believes in the authority of the Moralist Coalition and the RCM. He clearly takes issue with the community in Revachal self-policing via the Union. He's a great companion because he doesn't color everything with his own perspective, because he tries to remain neutral. But some of the most cutting criticisms of moralist ideology come in those subtle little moments when Kim comes up against ideas that challenge his position as an RCM officer, challenge the authority of the liberal democratic body he works for. He doesn't like it. After all, centrism is control. But Disco Elysium is perhaps harshest in how it depicts communism. And that's because the game is a love letter to communism. And in the most classic Marxist tradition, it shows its love with the most ruthless of criticism. And I'll tell you the reason I knew this game was written by communists long before the developers thanked Marx and Engels at the Game Awards. And Marx and Engels for providing us the political education. Thank you. <laughs> If you decide to be a communist, to go around saying communisty things, you can develop the idea Mazovian socioeconomics and follow the ideas of Kras Mazov, the Revachol version of our own Karl Marx. When you first get the thought, the sardonic approach Disco Elysium has to communism already becomes clear. The description reads, People think communism was just some crazy idea that had its comeuppance 40 years ago. A fever that shook the world, never to return again. They were right, until he woke up today. A spiritual corpse, responsive only to the call of Commodore Red, prostitutes, and Krasmazov. For him, communism is still a thing. He will single-handedly raise the commune of O2 from the oceanic trench where it has been resting, covered in ghosts and seaweed. He is the big communism builder. Come. Witness his attempt to rebuild communism in the year 51. This could only have been written by someone who knows all too well the feeling of looking around at the world and identifying problems in the way society is organized, only to be berated and made to think you're insane for suggesting that there's a better way. Made to think that nobody else in the world thinks like you do. When looking around Martinez at the incredible poverty of a place capitalist development has left in the dust, at people living in cinderblock shacks and a commercial area so defined by failure people say it's cursed, it's easy to find things that should lend themselves to meaningful discussions about class society. The events of the game largely revolve around a dock worker's strike and the threat of violent repression from the corporation they're striking against. But as you speak to the residents of Martinez, you find people are maybe a bit more like Kim, much more interested in discussing what is than what could be, accepting of the dominant ideology as a natural state, as a fact rather than a value. But the game still offers up dialogue options that let you wax poetic about the revolutionary proletariat. You can triumphantly declare we will execute landlords in the street. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. I don't disagree with a lot of those ideas, so I pick those dialogue options. I posture. I declare. I move no closer to making any of this real. I finish developing the Mazovian socioeconomics thought. It comes with a penalty to visual calculus because all I see is reaction. Reaction everywhere. The new text reads, Not point not 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 percent of communism has been built. Evil child murdering billionaires still rule the world with a shit eating grin. All he has managed to do is make himself sad. He is starting to suspect Krasmezov fucked him over, personally, with his socio-economic theory. It has, however, made him into a very smart boy with something like a university degree in truth. Instead of building communism, he now builds a precise model of this grotesque, duplicitous world. Yeah, I know the feeling. Harry can declare all he wants, all I want. Most people either roll their eyes or shrug and move on with the conversation. My words aren't real to them. They're a joke. A game. But how could they be anything else? I am the only communist in Revachol. 
I've found evidence of communism in the rooms of academics and in long-abandoned bunkers. People who are absent, somewhere else, maybe dead. How could I know? But no living, breathing communist, other than a couple of students with a two-man reading group so desperate for members that they let two cops join, the most left-wing people you find are those in the dock workers' union. They're striking to better their lot within the confines of the capitalist system. Of course, they don't take me seriously when I spew slogans about liquidating the bourgeoisie. They are pragmatic. They're trying to work with what's in front of them. Their class struggle is not a revolutionary one. They're not fighting to fundamentally change the state of things just to make it more favorable for them. It's a stark defiance of the logic of most RPGs that allow you to have an unprecedented influence in shaping the world around you. It's chilling in how real it can be. At this point, it can feel like the game is mocking you for even wanting to believe that we can change this world. But as the game progresses, something fascinating happens. Someone fascinating happens. The case you've come to Revachal to solve is the murder of a hanged man. I'm about to spoil the entire finale of this game, by the way. Because the thing you discover about the hanged man is that he was a mercenary hired by the Wild Pines Company to break the dock worker's strike. He's a real piece of shit, and more importantly to your case, he has a bullet in his head. The hanging was a cover-up. Near the end of the game, you travel to a small island just offshore and encounter who I consider to be the most important character in Disco Elysium, both in terms of the story and the political narrative of the game. The hanged man's killer, the deserter. The last survivor of the revolution that was crushed 50 years ago, living in isolation all this time, watching, seething with rage as the world seemed to move on to forget him and his comrades. I watched the people of this city turn the lights back on. More and more each year. Ruins, glimmering in the dark, like a fucking merry-go-round. It's disgusting. I gave my life to the revolution. To the people. I saw hope and joy. I saw young people looking to the future and actually seeing a future. I saw a world that didn't make me want to drown myself in the goddamn See, I saw what capital's agents do to people who dream. I saw what they do to people who resist, who stand for something. I saw young men blown to pieces. I saw the bodies piled up in the streets. I saw the mask slip. The mask of humanity fall from capital. It has to take it off to kill everyone, everything you love. All the hope and tenderness in the world. It has to take it off just for one second to do the deed. And then you see it as it strangles and beats your friends to death. The sweetest, most courageous people in the world. You see the fear and power in its eyes. Then you know that the bourgeois are not human. Now all I see is the shit. Rock and roll music is shit. My gun is shit. This world is shit. Counter-revolutionary, apathetic, suicidal, garbage, shit. We died for this? The material base for an uprising has eroded. The working class has betrayed mankind and themselves. The historic opportunity for a revolution has passed. It will not come back any more, however hard I try, whatever I do. The deserter is hopelessness. The deserter is defeat. The deserter kind of sounds like me sometimes, on my worst days. He believes the modern working class had betrayed the world, accepted their place as a permanent underclass of capital, incapable of realizing their position or fighting against their masters. The deserter is largely defined by a learned helplessness that is rooted in his inability to reckon with the past. While others may view the revolution as needless violence or as a tragic defeat of good people, to the deserter, 
the revolution is perfect. It is an untouchable, heroic moment that the people of this modern, degenerate world could never possibly compare to. No wonder he thinks it's impossible to build socialism today. If that idealized past failed, how could the people he looks down on from his isolation ever have a chance? Is this sounding familiar? The deserter is plagued by what Mark Fisher would call a lost future. Expanding on Derrida's concept of hauntology, the persistent of things from the past, haunting our present. Fisher believed our contemporary culture is haunted by futures that never came to be, whether they failed to be born on their own merits or were prevented from being born. Our present exists in the context of futures that never arrived. Living in the shadow of a future that was crushed before his very eyes, the deserter has shut himself off from the rest of human society, from the working class whose liberation he once fought for. Ever comparing the present to his own lost future, the deserter hates everyone, sees them all as traitors, as degenerates, as undeserving of his perfect idealized revolution. All he sees is reaction, reaction everywhere. The deserter is wrong about one key thing, that the conditions of revolution are gone and are never coming back. You don't meet the deserter until near the end of the game, which means you've spent hours immersed in the lives of the inhabitants of this impoverished place, still haunted by the failure of the revolution. Unlike the deserter who completely isolated himself, you actually spent your time among the people. While most people didn't pay any mind to your over-the-top communist rhetoric, one thing united nearly everyone you met, and it unites most of us in real life as well. We fucking hate this. And we are increasingly all too aware of our position in this society. Klausia, the woman whose lover was killed by the deserter, tells you about something called the return. She describes it as... It's part urban myth. Part political science. It's a fool's hope, sir. And it's also all I've got. They say there will be an event. That it will happen somewhere here. They say it will happen soon. And that it will change everything. But the return of what? Of the king. Of the nation. Of communism. Return on investment. I don't know exactly. It's meant to be vague. As promises generally are. But at the same time, I mean, things can't go on like this forever. Something will give. It always does. There is a pervasive sense that things simply cannot go on like this. That a future, whatever it may be, is coming. Could it be that the reason Fisher's ghosts of lost futures still haunt us is because the economic and social conditions, remember those things that drive history forward, those conditions that gave rise to those potential futures in the first place, still exist today? Is there not still poverty? Is there not still a class who labors for the enrichment of a class who owns? Disco Elysium goes a step further, asserting that these spectral futures are not just haunting us, they are demanding life. Asserting that perhaps the pendulum of history is still swinging. A return to an old way would only be an attempt to reset the clock. There is one future that has at every turn been prevented from being born. And again, the deserter is wrong. The conditions are here. They couldn't be better. The deserter nearly kicked off a war between a militant union and the Wild Pines Corporation with a single shot. The case you came to Martinez to solve may be as small as the murder of one man, but that murder is at the center of an enormous class contradiction that seems to be heating up by the day. The world of Disco Elysium flatly rejects the deserter's defeatist outlook. He, like the rest of Martinez, and like Harry Dubois himself, is defined by his inability to reckon with the past. And the product of being haunted by so many lost futures is that it can become impossible to imagine an actual future. Earlier, I said Disco Elysium uses very little allegory and simply addresses political issues directly, but with a few notable exceptions. The most notable exception is... The Pale. The Pale is described as the enemy of matter and life. 
the transitional state into nothingness. It is a physical representation of absence. But what if the pale is not so much a place as a condition? Near the end of the game, you discover that the pale only came into existence when humans did. In Mark Fisher's work, Capitalist Realism, he describes a pervasive sense that there is nothing beyond the current socioeconomic order. That we cannot imagine a world that is not capitalist. Which is why, even in our wildest fictional worlds, capitalist property relations and modes of production often remain intact. Capitalist realism is a condition that relegates any visions of a post-capitalist world as occupying this idealized, hazy, distant place that isn't quite real. Thoughts of socialism or any other way of changing how society is ordered are beyond the pale. It is significant that as Harry, you will most likely hear about the Pale for the first time from Joyce, the stand-in for naked, ruthless capitalism itself, who warns of its encroaching as some world-ending threat. After all, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. The Pale is the key to fully understanding what this game is saying about how we understand history. The world of Disco Elysium understands history as being driven by special individuals known as the Innocents. An innocence is infallible. The decisions made by one are not decisions. They are inevitabilities. What would have happened anyway? Only accelerated, packed into decades instead of centuries. An innocence is a continuous compressed event, a sacred human being. And Dolores Day, the most recent innocence, literally sent ships out into the Pale and discovered the New World. If we understand the Pale as the limits on what we perceive as possible, as the end of the horizon of possible futures we can imagine, the innocentic system is asserting that only an innocence, only a special, superhuman individual, can expand that horizon, can move beyond the Pale. These are literal, canonized, great men of history. Not unlike the way we tend to erroneously view history in the real world. We act as if individual leaders are solely responsible for massive societal changes. The rise and fall of empires. This serves to belittle us, regular people. We couldn't possibly change the world. That can only happen when a once in a thousand years, great person comes along and changes the world for us. It is the exact opposite of Marx's conception of historical materialism. And the game fully rejects it. Harry's ex, who represents the past he can't come to terms with and move on from, appears to him as Dolores Day, as the figurehead of an ideological whitewashing of history that prevents all of us, from truly understanding it and our place in it. We are all shackled by the idea of Dolores Day, of some special person coming along and saving us from all of this. And the horror of the creeping realization that nobody is coming. We are alone. And we're all we've got. The deserter lived through a revolution, a popular uprising of the masses against their rulers, something that now resides firmly in the distant realms of thought beyond capitalist realism, beyond the pale. Not unlike the old trucker you encountered near the strike who had driven through the pale one too many times, his mind was lost to it. With hope for a better world, Firmly beyond the pale, he plunged into weird incel obsessions and misanthropy. However, it's only in the reactionary misery of the deserter that we really begin to get a glimpse of real hope. That hope is found in contrast to his worldview that is so tragically frozen in time. It is a hope based in the reality that the irreconcilable tensions built into class society are still here. And despite how it felt for nearly the entire game, you weren't the only one who could articulate it. You did meet another living, breathing communist in Martinez, even if you didn't realize it at the time. Cindy, a young artist who meets you with hostility for being a cop. The last words you hear from her in this game come in the form of a piece of art, painted in red, mixed with heavy fuel, 
and the blood of the people who died in a shootout between the Dock Workers Union and fascist mercenaries hired by the Wild Pines Corporation. Her message is a reminder, in a game so intent on showing us the consequences of being so mired in a past that we cannot come to terms with, that history is not a passive, dead thing. It is alive, and it is part of our present, and it is made up of social forces beyond our control. Her message is a burning signal, so bright it could be seen by the Coalition airships over Martinez. A threat from the present that is boiling over. A promise from the ghosts of a past that still haunt us. A love letter from the future that is clawing at the edges of the possible, from beyond the pale, screaming to be born. One day, I will return to your side.